WTN. This is Open Line with today's host, Father Mitch Pacwa. In North America, call toll free 1 833 288 EWTN. That's 1 833 288 3986. Outside North America, call 1 205 271 2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. Welcome to Wednesday and EWTN's Open Line Wednesday. Father Mitch Pack was in the house. If you've got a question for Father Mitch, <coughs> excuse me, the number <coughs> is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, that number is one 205 Two seven one two nine eight five, and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line if you're outside of the United States and Canada at one two zero five two seven one two nine eight five. You can always send us an email, open line at ewtn.com, or you can uh, well, and actually that's the extent of it right now. Open line at ewtn.com. Our texting services is on the fritz, so I. Will not give you that information. I am Jack Williams, however. Michael McCall producing the program. Your call screener is Matt Gubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host, as he is every Wednesday, straight from the mean streets of Chicago, Father Mitch Paco, how are you? Were there some other streets? <laughs> Not many. You know, it's interesting. I went. I was telling the story today in a different context, but uh, I, when I was in my early to mid twenties, I'm a native St. Louisan, so there's a bit of a natural rivalry, especially when it comes to sports between St. Louis and Chicago. And I was there for a meeting, and uh, the Blackhawks were play- were in the playoffs. And the forum in Montreal where the Canadians played in the Maple Leaf, and Maple Leaf Gardens had recently closed. And so I wasn't going to let that happen. And I said, I'm going to go to a game at Chicago Stadium before they close it down. Mm-hmm. So I drove down there. Uh, it was all I had hoped it would be. It was, you know, just a terrific experience. One of the legendary venues in American culture. And I went to leave and I had locked my keys in the car. And you know what that neighborhood's like. Yes. And the police would not even open the car. And so as people are filtering out and there are fewer and fewer and fewer people around me, I'm getting nervouser and nervouser and nervouser. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally I did find a kind soul that was able to get the car open without breaking the window. And I was able to escape with my life. From a the kind mean, soul. The mean mm-hmm. streets of Chicago. And Sounds they built like... that brand new arena. They built it right across the street in the same doggone neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're gentrifying that area. Yeah, well, there you have it. Yeah. So how are you? Fine. Yeah? Groovy. Got some emails over there yes. that have nothing to do with the Blackhawks? N- nothing. <laughs> no, one in, right. no one in more need of redemption right now than the Blackhawks. <laughs> All right. Dear Father Mitch, this is from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Not Melbourne, Florida. Melbourne, Australia. Yeah, yes. Thank God and bless you for your wonderful ministries. In the Nicene Creed, the words, and he became man, a priest, instead of using these words, says, and he became one of us. Is it theologically correct to change the words? Um, no. <laughs> because here's, here's the problem with that. When you say he became one of us, which us? I assume that the priest is a vertebrate. So is it just one of us vertebrates? Yeah, is he, that I, I assume about. that the priest is a mammal. Did Are you saying just that our Lord became a mammal? Um, you, know, is, you know, is it one of the anthropoid um, species that he's talking about among many. Um, what? He, this is too vague. In fact, 
contrary to the desires of some in our culture, <laughs> this is too inclusive. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes anywhere from the whales to the mice, uh, if you want to include us vertebrates. You know, the, the, you see the problem. And so this, uh, he's trying to avoid the word man. And that, because that is considered politically incorrect in some circles. Um, but you also have to keep in mind, I don't know how it is in <coughs> Australia, but um, one of the representatives in our House of Rep National House, House of Representatives um, said that when asked, can a man have a baby and an abortion? And she said yes. You know, so, you know, this is a goofy kind of inclusion because that's not possible. <laughs> just, this is talking nonsense. So, um, no, our Lord, be, it, it says in the text, at homo factus s, and he became man. So that's, that's that. From Harriet, <coughs> I've been praying the rosary of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows when I meditate on Mary holding Jesus after they take him off the cross. I was wondering how they actually took him off the cross. Did they lower the cross or climb on a ladder to take him off? Do you have any idea how Jesus was removed from the cross? Um, the, the ladder... You know, again, I wasn't there, um, but the latter is the best explanation. The uh, the upright piece of the cross would have pretty much stayed where it was. It would have remained in position, and so uh, this would be um, uh, something that um, you know that that would have required them to take our Lord down by getting on a ladder. And, and in fact, um, over uh, at Calvary, you see it depicted exactly that way, whether by the Catholics or by the Orthodox in the various uh, murals and uh, mosaic icons that it's, it's by ladder. Another interesting question, Joseph asks, my question about praying the rosary with devotion, almost always use a scriptural-based rosary from YouTube. I will typically begin while I'm getting ready for work and conclude during the commute. Am I showing a lack of devotion by not giving my full attention or meditating on the mysteries throughout the entire prayer? My intention is never just to check it off the list for the day and move on. I'm obviously confused over the meaning of devotion. wish my prayers to be as efficacious as possible. Um, a couple things, Joseph. If, you know, if you're praying the rosary while you're doing a number of other things, you won't be able to give it your full attention. Okay, that's just a, a reality. Um, but at the same time, when you consider some of the alternatives, that that it, what you do is you focus on the rosary as best you can, and put a lot of the world's, you know, thoughts and wishes in the background. So you know, for a lot of people, they get ready while they're listening to the radio, uh, and commercials. And the news and politicians talking and all this stuff, whereas, uh, and they put that as sort of, you know, part of the background. They're paying attention, but they're doing other things as well. By uh, praying the rosary at that time, you are, you know, um, having that prayerful quality as you get ready for the day, but it's not the full attentive prayer. So what you will need to do at you know another moment in the day is have some time when you can sit and focus your attention on the rosary or the other meditations. Um, and it, it's not, it's just like uh, a lot of the conversations we have uh, at work and 
just walking around. You know, hi, how are you? Fine, you do okay, yeah, I'm okay. You don't really want to know, for the most part, how people are really doing. But you do keep a friendly atmosphere. By praying while you're doing other things, you're keeping a prayerful atmosphere. But then you need to go and focus on the prayer. Just like there are times when somebody at your office is a good friend, you say, well, really, how are you doing? Because you don't look so good. Um, and you want to find out then and give them attention. So that would be a good parallel. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. 833-288-3986. It's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch. The most original and exclusive Catholic content is on EWTN Radio. I think EWTN News Nightly is beneficial in a number of ways. Not only do we provide the news of the day, but also thoughtful analysis on important issues. That's all viewed from the lens of a Catholic perspective, something you will not find in mainstream media. EWTN News Nightly with Tracy Siebel. Tonight, 9 Eastern on EWTN Television and Radio. Christ is the answer with Father John Ricardo. Let us strive to know the Lord. Quick question to you and me right now. Is that what you and I are doing every single day? When you and I wake up every day, do we strive to know Jesus or not? In the Old Testament, in the same book of Hosea, a little bit later on, it's in chapter 14, the Lord says through the prophet, my people perish. Or in another translation, my people are being destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Not a lack of data, we got tons of data. Not a lack of information, we got a lot of information. Not just about things that are happening in the world, we got a lot of data, a lot of knowledge, a lot of information about God. But not a lot of intimacy with God. Not a lot of relationship with God. Not a lot of friendship. That's the cry of God's heart. God wants to give himself to us in the incredible gift of friendship and we're not taking advantage of it. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, May is a month dedicated to our Blessed Mother, and we've got a beautiful new item at EWTN's Religious Catalog, the Marian Apparition Rosary Bracelet. You can celebrate Mary all during the month of May with this stylish glass bead bracelet featuring images of the 10 most highly investigated and approved Marian apparitions in history. Each bracelet comes with a beautiful explanation guide of each of the medals. It's strung on an elastic cord that will stretch and fit most wrists, the Marian Apparition Rosary Bracelet was designed by the Miracle Hunter himself, Michael O'Neill, the award-winning host of EWTN radio program, The Miracle Hunter, creator and host of EWTN programs, They Might Be Saints, and Explore with the Miracle Hunter. It's available now at EWTN's Religious Catalog. That's EWTNRC.com. Free standard shipping of online orders of $75 or more. That's standard shipping in the continental U.S. only. Use the code FREE at Check out. Two lines open for you at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. First up today is Nugent, a first-time caller in Detroit, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. Nugent, you are on with Father Mitch. Hello, Father. How are you? I'm well, thank you. What can we do for you this fine day? Yes, I, my question is, what is the Catholic Church's view of the Holy Fire Christian Orthodox tradition? You know, I, I don't know that uh, there is a particular official stance. You know, this is um, uh, something that—so that, so folks understand that when the Orthodox celebrate, the, the Patriarch of Jerusalem usually— is in Jerusalem to celebrate um, uh, the great Pascha or Easter. And while 
inside the tomb, there is a spontaneous fire, correct? Correct. Yes. And that from the, the lighting of that fire, uh, it, it is shared with other people. And, you know, so they'll light their uh, candles from that, from that light, and, and that'll go throughout the, the whole of the church. Uh, and there usually is a good-sized crowd for that. It's, a, you know, it's the greatest feast of the year. So uh, I've never heard anybody give any official position on it. Um, I don't, you know, usually when something miraculous happens, the Catholic Church will go and do an investigation. And this is not... Um, something that we would have jurisdiction to investigate. You know, this would be up to the uh, 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 the Orthodox patriarch to investigate that or initiate an investigation. And that's why we don't, you know, have any kind of official statement. It, it would not be our jurisdiction. It's the jurisdiction of the Greek Orthodox. And um, if they asked us about, you know, some of the scientists we know or something, um, we would certainly cooperate and help. But, you know, at this point, it's their jurisdiction and uh, something that they experience annually as a regular miracle. And it's a, it's a time of great excitement when that occurs. Have you been to Jerusalem for that? I have been to Jerusalem, but I have not been to Jerusalem for that specifically. No, neither have I. I've, I've been there for Catholic Easter, but never for Orthodox Easter. So I've just not been there for that. But um, I, I know that it is something that's truly a very exciting thing. So um, so that's just, you know, um, we trust the Orthodox on that. That's their, um, with, with something they have. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Grab this one open phone line at 833-288-3986. Next up is Sean in Atlanta, Georgia, listening on the EWTN app. Sean, you're on with Father Mitch. Hi, Father Mitch. Hi. What can we do for you? So I was watching a debate with Ehrman and Aiken. And Ehrman's claim was, was that the Gospels was unreliable. Right, and one thing right. He, one, and one thing he cited as evidence was saying that Joseph was from, one account says Joseph was from Bethlehem, and the other account says he's from Nazareth. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so then he, um, Aiken said, this was his own opinion, he said uh, maybe they had two homes, that mm-hmm. Joseph was born in Ephraim, Bethlehem and went to work in Nazareth, mm-hmm. but then it begged a question on some of the comments that I was reading. So then, why didn't they have a place? You know, when right. um, Mary gave birth. All right so, now, um, let let me ask you this, Sean. Are you originally from Atlanta? No, I'm from Cleveland. <laughs> I somehow <laughs> detected that you were a Midwesterner, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and you can you can talk about yeah, my home is in Cleveland. But you don't have a, I, I don't know if you have a house there, but, you know, I, I'm originally from Chicago, and I'll, I'll speak it of as my hometown, but it's, I don't have a home there. And, you know, St. Joseph, you know, being from the family of David, um, very, it, I, I think that you can put these two together, that he's from Bethlehem. But he moved to Nazareth. There, there had been a rebellion in Galilee by the Zealot party. And they uh, destroyed much of the uh, Roman capital of Sepphoris. And Sepphoris is just a, a mile and a half walk from Nazareth, just over the ridge. And you know, it, it. We have this experience all the time that you may be from one place, but when 
there's new job opportunities, you move to another. And so he's from Bethlehem. Uh, I and I doubt that he would have kept, you know, a uh, summer home or something in uh, in uh, Bethlehem. He, he was not a rich man, uh, like my dad, you know, who had to leave Chicago to go find work down in uh, uh, Florida, Miami, back in the early fifties. You know, we just moved. That's where the work was, so that's what we did. That's the way I see what St. You know, Joseph. Now, Ehrman, uh, uh, this is Bart Ehrman. Uh, he's, you know, he, he got uh, some good credentials as a scholar, but he came to scholarship as an evangelical. And as is the case with a number of evangelicals I've known, they start off with a sola scriptura be, uh, belief. They believe that it's the Bible alone. And that if God said it, it's true. If there's something false in the, in the uh, Bible, then God is a liar. Now, where Bart Ehrman apparently had some struggles is when you take a look at the manuscripts, you see that there are copyists' errors. And he's not the first evangelical to have this kind of difficulty, that when there are errors in copies, then the Bible must be false. And this is something that is highly problematic. Now, the errors are not, you know, the, the, the variations in text, I wouldn't even call them so much errors, uh, the variations in texts um, are pretty minimal. For instance, um, the oldest copy we have of Luke dates back to about 185 AD, and it is in 94% agreement, textually, you know, word for word, letter for letter, with the text that we have in Rome from 325 A.D., so that copyists were very, very careful. And, you know, sometimes it'll be a difference of, instead of saying you singular, they'll say you plural, which in Greek you can detect. Uh, that's a slight, you know, copyist error, and then you evaluate manuscripts to check it out. That's what we do in scholarship. But that and a few other things uh, be means that God's a liar. So Bart Ehrman is on a quest to try and find out as many errors as possible to show that God is not really the author of this. This is not trustworthy. And he's straining sometimes to find these things. And, you know, there are, again, as in the case with uh, St. Joseph moving from Nazareth to go work in, uh, excuse me, moving from Bethlehem to go to Naz Nazareth, it's, it's, it's a simple explanation. It's not like, okay, that means the whole gospel is false. You know, that's that's Ehrman's uh, approach, uh, from what I can tell. And he does a number of other things, too. Um, you know, like, like saying it's something of a wise guy thing. Um, well, none of these ancient manuscripts have... Uh, are, are with Luke's penmanship or, or Luke's, you know, handwritten name. Yeah, but the manuscripts we have indicate that it's Luke. Uh, for instance, in that manuscript from 185, it says this is the end of Luke and then the beginning of John. I mean, it's pretty clear. So, um, you know, Ehr Ehrman is straining for, you know, straws. D does that help at all? That does help. So when he came down to pay taxes, it's because of his lineage with David. When That's he came down exact, to and this would have been his hometown, and you have to register within your hometown. That's, oh, okay. Because then Ehrman looked and said the same thing that you said. It's not probably plausible that he could have two homes. No, probably at, not. At, but <laughs> it's, it's just still your hometown. Like Cleveland is yours. Yes. Okay. Makes 
<laughs> Thank you, Father Mitch. Sure. Thanks, Sean. We appreciate the phone call. That frees up a line for you at 833-288-EWTN. <clears throat> That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to hear from you. That number is one 205 271 Two nine eight five. Straight ahead, we'll talk to Mike in Washington, John in the great state of Michigan, Chris in also in the great state of Michigan, and hopefully we'll speak to you as well at 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. It's EWTN's Open Line Wednesday with Father Mitch Pacwa. These are trying times, friends. We live in an era where pro-abortion activists lecture us about morality. Enemies of marriage lecture us about love. Those who challenge basic human biology lecture us about science. We're crushed by every agenda on every side, in the media, the workplace, and sometimes by your own families. And yet, I'm joyful. I'm hopeful. Why? Let me let you in on a little secret, because I have the solution, and it hasn't changed in 2,000 years. When you're in a fight, your skin gets cold. That's because your blood is rushing from your extremities to where you need it the most to survive, your muscles and your heart. We're in a fight for our lives as a church. It's time to get back to basics. It's time to start proclaiming the love of God and Jesus Christ to the world again with new hope and vigor. That message has lost none of its power to change the world and your life. Are you in? This is Chris Stefanik from reallifecatholic.com. Want to be notified when EWTN Open Line goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click the bell icon to be notified. EWTN is everywhere. EWTN Radio programming is provided free of charge to over 500 domestic and international AM and FM radio stations. It's a great teaching tool for Catholics and non-Catholics alike. For a complete list of EWTN AM and FM stations across America, visit EWTNradio.net. At the bottom of the page, click Affiliates. EWTN, the global Catholic network. Tomorrow on More to Life, a million pieces. We'll help you manage your stress and put the pieces back together. That's tomorrow on More to Life. Now back to Open Line with Father Mitch Paquin. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I'm going to give a big shout out to one of our longtime EWTN Radio family members. They're celebrating their anniversary this week. Catholic Radio Network is celebrating 18 years on the air, beginning with one station, little one little old station in Kansas City, Missouri. They're now on 18 signals in Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado. Congratulations to Jim and Carolyn O'Laughlin and their team at Catholic Radio Network celebrating 18 years of great Catholic radio with EWTN. Uh, Great perseverance by Jim O'Laughlin to uh, keep all those stations rolling and on the air. And double kudos to Carolyn O'Laughlin for keeping all those stations on the air and putting up with Jim O'Laughlin. So congratulations to the good folks, the O'Laughlins, and everybody there at Catholic Radio Network. Back to the phones we go. Mike is in Tri-Cities, Washington, listening on KTNH Radio. Mike, you're on with Father Mitch. Hi, Father Mitch. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. (laughs) Okay, so we were having a family game night, had a discussion Mm -hmm. about truth. Okay. And there happened to be a card on the table with a six on it, and... A couple of my college-educated children mm-hmm. <laughs> said that the truth depends on your point of view. To me, it looks like a six. To you, it looks like a nine. From my point of view, not knowing anything about what a six is, it's a nine. And I was like, uh, no, nah, truth is objective. But, you know, that's not a good answer. So, um, Okay. A couple things that you may want to try. Um uh, that I would recommend. 
disinherit them and see <laughs> and see if they still feel that they can live off of the money you earned over the years. See if that, let them find out whether that is an objective truth or just a feeling that you, that you disinherited them. And I, oh, okay. you know, it's, uh, in other words, they, they have to learn about things. Now, they're playing a game because the number six can be turned upside down and look somewhat like a nine, depending on which font you are using. <laughs> Or in my case, if you're trying to read my chicken scratch writing, I flunked penmanship four times, and that was objective. <laughs> the sisters objectively knew that my penmanship was terrible. Um, so, you know, um, do something that they would recognize as an objective reality, like being disinherited and see if that feels subjective to them. Or, um, don't challenge some of them but uh, to do this, but you can also say, get on a box and jump off. Is, it, is gravity going to pull you objectively toward the center of the earth, or is there going to be a subjective experience of something else? If you're to do it from a high enough height, um, you know, I don't want to encourage anybody to try that as an experiment. But if you were to, you know, jump off of a building, um, it's not a subjective feeling of joyful flying through the air. It's falling because the law of gravity is an objective law. Um, and, you know, you can... <coughs> Also, or you can say, okay, uh, sixes and nines are all subjective, so um, I'm going to take 90% of your uh, inheritance and give it to uh, a good charity. <laughs> Again, ha they have to con they're, they're playing games, I suspect, taught them by the, some of the foolish professors that may have taught them. Uh, to, to disbelieve in reality. And the only way to have them understand that there's an objective reality is to deal with concrete things, not with abstract possibilities and, and, and concepts. Um, that would be my suggestion. How does that sound to you, Mike? It sounds pretty good. Um... As a matter of fact, Do you have a resource, like something I could read? Um, um, would you recommend a book or something about? Ooh. You could throw the book at them. I'm not the sharpest tool in the You could throw the book at them. No, <laughs> don't throw books. You're, someone's going to get hurt, objectively <laughs> speaking. Um, and so uh, I, don't, I, I don't know uh, of a book that address there are i just can't think of one at the you know who you might want to look up online I, this is a good source he's been a guest on my show um uh, any uh, number of times look up Ant dr anthony rizzi r-i-z-z-i -Z he's on the internet and he's got an institute father anthony uh, uh, dr anthony rizzi is a physicist who was part of the team that got a Nobel Prize a few years ago for physics. I'm, just, I'm like five, five years or so ago. And he would be a good resource. Um, they may accept him as a legitimate thinker because he is a Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist. But he talks about getting people in contact with concrete physical things as a way to discover reality rather than abstractions. And that would be a good source. How does that sound? Good. Okay. 
Thank All you right. so much. Appreciate Absolutely. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. One open line for you at 833-288-3986. Next up is John in Northfield, Michigan, listening on Ave Maria Radio. John, you're on with Father Mitch. Hello, Father Mitch. Hi, what can we do for you? Well, I was confused about all the reading in the lives of the saints about Mm -hmm. Constantinople. And uh, your screener advised me that it was now Istanbul, and that's why I couldn't find it. Yes. And so uh, the things I read about are like when Gregory the Great, when he was seventh deacon, was sent there. Mm -hmm. I think he was on a mission to get help. Well, uh, uh, he was the papal legate to Constantinople. Oh, okay. That's that's why he went. So the Pope was in Rome. Right. And uh he was sent as a legate to Constant Constantinople where the capital was. Remember by his time the Western Roman Empire had collapsed. There was no emperor in the West. So the em- the only emperor was in Constantinople, but the emperor had very little um, influence in the West. He tried, uh, especially Emperor Justinian tried. He sent General Belisarius to try to reconquer Italy from the Lombards, and th- they had limited success. North Africa, uh, they tried to reconquer that in Spain, but they had you know, very limited and short-lived uh, success in doing that. So, you know, it was basically, uh, the, the West was, you know, pretty much separated from Constantinople. So the Pope sent a legate there. Does that help? Uh, yes, and I, I was just wondering about the contrast between the two. Uh, I mean, I, it seems like I have a zero knowledge of Constantinople. Uh, the uh, contrast you know. between what two? Constantinople and? and? And, you know, the Western Church. You know, the Byzantine Church. Oh, the, oh, oh, okay. And the Roman Church. Yeah. Uh, Remember, at that at that time, they were still one Catholic church. Everybody was Catholic and Orthodox. You'd use those terms interchangeable for both Western and Eastern Christians. Um, but, but, you know, one of the problems that had gotten wider and wider is that in the East, they spoke Greek. In the West... You had lots of barbarians speaking their own dialects, but you know official church business was done in Latin. And Justinian, who was emperor in that same 6th century, uh, as Gregory was there, was the last uh, emperor of Constantinople who knew Latin. After him, they didn't even know Latin anymore. And in the West, they didn't know Greek. So when you have that kind of breakdown of communication because you don't speak the same language anymore. Uh, You start to see that differences are going to come up in the way they translate and understand terms, things like that. So that, and that, but that still took uh, a good 500 years or nearly 500 years after Pope St. Gregory the Great. Um, it would be in the middle of the 11th century. Um, and so that there was a greater break. So that's, um, you know, uh, that, that's how that difference developed. But, you know, you know, and they used leavened bread and the Latins used unleavened. But, you know, they, they still had, you know, so went to each other's liturgies and such. God bless you, John. We appreciate the phone call today. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. That's the number Chris used. A first-time caller in New Baltimore, Michigan, listening at EWTN.com. Chris, you are on with Father Mitch. Hi, Father Mitch. Hi, what can we do for you? Hey, I I have a question. I don't know if it's a common question or not, but it's a question in my head anyway Mm -hmm. that uh, you know, I, I, I've not really got a good answer on, and uh, you seem to answer all the questions that I have eventually through TV or radio. But mm-hmm. <clears throat> if you go to confession often and you begin to sound like a broken record, as I do, mm-hmm. uh, repeating the same sins, 
and you have one parish priest who hears this weekly, um, I I can be kind of embarrassed slash mm-hmm. disgruntled, kind of maybe uh, don't want to go to confession as much. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that that's set in yet. Um, I do go to confession very frequently, but really? I feel like a broken record. And yeah. I just don't know how to overcome that feeling that I have. I mean, seeing any new sins to my list, <laughs> but it seems that the sins that I'm confessing are uh, redundant. Uh, Chris, let me. I've been hearing confessions for 46 years. And let me assure you that most of the time, the, the sins are fairly the, much the same. I'm not sitting in the confessional looking for the variety hour. That's not my goal. And it's there for you uh, to confess your sins, know the forgiveness of Christ, and you know to seek the graces to fight against sin. You know, some some sins become habits and are difficult to deal with. Ask any alcoholic or drug addict how difficult it is to get over some things. But if they don't keep trying, then it gets worse. So, A, please, don't try new sins. <laughs> Uh, work, you know, continue to uh, work on the old ones. Again, continually asking the grace. And here's some some of the things that you may want to consider. Um, one would be to go make a retreat every year, and you know, and get some time where somebody with a fresh perspective on the spiritual life and repentance can maybe give you some new insights. That look for new insights and new depth, not new sins. Uh, we don't need that. Um, and, and again, even if you try to get new ones, they're still the same old ones we generally hear. Um, the, seek that insight. And one of the other things to do is when we keep committing the same sin, there's a mixture in our motives. On one hand, we want to stop. On the other hand, we kind of like that sin. You know, if you're, if you're confessing gossip all the time, um, it, yeah, yeah, I don't like to be a gossip, but boy, I really do like the gossip. You have to own up to that. You have to own up and admit that what I'm doing is something I like, but I don't want to like it anymore. And you you may have to do deeper examinations of conscience, inviting our Lord deeper into your own heart to ask him, Lord, why do I like this sin enough to keep doing it? What attracts me to it? What keeps me held in it? And there are a number of things that will be part of that. You have to, uh, again, engage our Lord in that. Uh, you might want to meditate on various, uh, the conversion of various sinners. Matthew the tax collector and uh, Mark chapter 2. Or uh, someone like the... Um, uh, the woman who had been a prostitute, the public sinner, in Luke 7, who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You know, maybe to meditate on some of those passages about sin. Or Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a great source of meditation on overcoming sin. And, you know, the, and how difficult it was for David. Uh, so, these, that's more where you want to go. Don't worry about boring the priest. Um, that's not why we're there to get exciting new stories. Um, we can't do anything with them if we did hear them. So it's you deepening your conversion. Does that help? 
tremendously. Thank you, Father Mitch. God bless you. Bless you, too. Thank you, Chris. We appreciate that phone call. You know, many of our listeners are familiar with Dr. Gracie Christie. She hosts Conversations with Consequences right here on EWTN Radio. But her husband, Dr. Stephen Christie, has a new book out on the pro-life movement. And uh, you guys are going to chat about that tonight on EWTN Live, huh? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Because, you know, um, the uh, arguments and the anger has been ramping up. And the church's teaching is viewed as a political stance. That's not what it's about for us. It's not about parties or political platforms. It's about saving the lives of innocent children from being cut to pieces. That's that's what it's about. We'll talk about those issues and common answers. And he's a lawyer, so he has a good sense of the law and what's going on in society. Yeah, that's Dr. Stephen Christie on EWTN Live tonight with Father Mitch, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN Radio and Television. We head next to Jacksonville, Florida. Anthony is in Jacksonville listening on EWTN.com. Anthony, you're on with Father Mitch Pacwa. Thank you so much for taking my call, uh, Father. Sure. I really appreciate appreciate all the work that you do. My question is this. After Pentecost, uh, the disciples uh, went out and spread the word, and they went to the temple. And my question is, do we, to our knowledge, have any knowledge that actual mass was conducted in the temple itself? Uh, I would say that it is most likely not. The ceremonies done in the temple were very clearly prescribed and directed by the priests, uh, the, uh, the, mostly of the Sadducee party, um, and th- that wouldn't be the case. It would be seen as more parallel to the Beracha meal on Friday nights that Jewish people celebrated. This, that's why it says in Acts that they uh, had the breaking of the bread in their homes. So they would celebrate Mass at their homes, not in the temple. That was a place of animal sacrifice, plus some other sacrifices too. And they were not looking to the animal sacrifices anymore. So that's why they, um, that and uh, a variety of issues, they would not have celebrated Mass in the temple, but in their homes. Okay? Okay. Thank you so much, Father. You're welcome. Thank you, Anthony. We appreciate the phone call. Brian from Detroit is watching on Facebook Live, and he says he'd like to know about the Catholic view of the days of creation. He mm-hmm. says creationism at least spells out how long we've been on the planet, which helps figure out our own timeline. Is there a date for the Earth and Homo sapiens according to the Catholic Church? He said he asked a priest once who said that the days of creation are symbolical. Okay. Uh, first of all, Brian, uh, there, there's no one uh, official Catholic view of the meaning of those days. That's that's just it's just not. Um, you know, this is something that you know we we keep our eyes on what Scripture says, what science is re- researching, and so on. Secondly, you have to keep in mind that we determine the amount of time in a day based on the spin of the earth. And with the earth spin, it's just a little bit over 24 hours for the earth to spin on its axis. However, that could not be the definition of a day before the earth was created. And, you know, if you go to some of the other planets that have different sizes, different composition. Uh, some are gaseous, some are solid, and they, they uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, they spin at different speeds than the Earth. So the concept day is relative. And before the Earth existed, when the universe was first started, a day could refer to the spin of the whole uh, universe because the, the universe is in motion. 
And you see signs of that motion in things like the Milky Way and other uh, galaxies that have spins to them. So you could be talking about uh, uh, a couple billion years for a sidereal day for the amount of time it takes to spin the whole universe. So, you know, keep that in mind. And what we want to do is learn what we can to about uh, the, the best. And they're still learning. Scientists are still learning a lot about the nature of the universe and the galaxies and so on. So we try to keep that in balance without going crazy to one position or another and, um, and, and keep that uh, sense of mind. It's not just a symbol, but it's what a day means is something that would be relative to what you're talking about. Quickly, we'll go to Louie, a first-time caller driving through the great state of Florida, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. Louie, you're on with Father Mitch. What's your question today? Hey, oh, Father. My question is, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, mm-hmm. and the only way to the Father is through me. Right. However, I believe that there are other people, the Jewish people, that probably go to heaven, and I'm not calling, I'm not saying Jesus lied, but I have a hard time. Why would he say something that... Okay, uh, Louis. Don't, don't make yourself a bigger problem than you need. Let me give you a little clue. If You know the parable in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and following, when he said at the, when the Son of Man comes on the cloud with his angels, he will gather the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and say to the sheep, when I was hungry, thirsty, naked, and in prison, you helped me. And he said, we didn't know it was you. He said, whenever you did it to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. And for the ones who fail to, to do those things, they fail to do it to Jesus. It is correct to say that the salvation comes through Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. However, for those who, for a variety of reasons, and includes many, uh, I'd say a lot of Jewish people, uh, reason we don't have time to go into right now, but for people who do what is good without knowing that it's really Jesus, Jesus counts that as done to him or neglected to be done to him. So they will be judged by that standard of, even though they don't know him, what they did to the least of their brethren, the people that could not help them back, is um, what, what they did to Jesus. Does that help? Yes, it does. And th- some of the politicians who like that passage, so oh, I am a Matthew 25 Christian. Remember, Jesus, our Lord, will take what you do to the least of his brethren in the womb as having been done to him. You promote to kill the children in the womb, you're doing it to Jesus. Would you leave us with a blessing? Lord, bless you all and keep you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father Mitch Pacwa, our producer, Michael McCall, call screener Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams. Thanks for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line Wednesday. Back at it tomorrow with Dominican Father Brian Mullady. Until we get together then, God bless.